Good morning. I think we're about ready to get started here. Um, so welcome to our second session of the Virtual Oral Health Equity Summit. I am Brittany Brown and I'm the Director of the Office of Oral Health at DPH and I'm going to be the monitor for today's the moderator for today's session. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, everybody is muted, so please feel free to use the chat box for anything. We will be doing Q&A at the end of the webinar today, so use the Q&A feature in the webinar to submit any questions. Uh, closed captioning is available, and you can open that up by uh, hovering over the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the presentation today is being recorded and will be posted to uh, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health Oral Health Equity Project webpage on mass.gov. Um, and last but not least, there is an evaluation that will be sent out after the webinar closes. Um, and that web, uh, the evaluation needs to be completed if you are looking to get CEs for this webinar. Um, so before we jump into the presentations, uh, we just want to get a sense of who is on the webinar today. So I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll if everybody could take just a couple of seconds to answer that. All right, just a couple more seconds. We have about 80% of people who have responded. Excellent. So I'll end this here and I'll share so we can see um, about 50% of people on the phone are dental professionals. We have a few medical professionals, health educators, community health workers, school nurses, and other. Um, if you reported an other in the poll, feel free to put your uh, position into the chat box so we can get a sense of who's on the phone. Awesome. And now, so I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Dr. Rosie Wagner will be giving a presentation on promoting equity through acceptance and treating the non-traditional dental patient. Uh, Dr. Wagner is uh, attended the University at Buffalo School of Dental Medicine and completed a GPR at Tufts before founding her own practice. Practice and Dr. Wagner's office focuses on treating patients with dental phobia, dental avoidance, and special health care needs. So Dr. Wagner, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to you. Great, thank you so much, Brittany. And thank you everyone for joining us today. All right, screen should be up. And feel free to jot down any questions you have as we move along here. Uh, the, uh, my contact information is here. Feel free to call or email me anytime. And at the end of both presentations, we'll be having a Q&A session. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Perfect. Uh, does anyone else see that blinking bar at the bottom or are we good, Brittany? Nope, I don't see anything. I think you're good to go. All right. So we're going to go over a few topics here on accepting patients who are less traditional or who folks, uh, folks that you may not have as much experience with um, on making your practice accessible. I'll be focusing on the dental office, of course, but this is applicable to other types of medical settings um, and other medical homes. So we'll be discussing oral care for people of all genders, for people with a history of trauma, uh, people who have housing or food insecurity for a variety of reasons, uh, people with disabilities of all kinds, and then something that's pretty universal um, in the dental setting, people with um, phobia, with avoidance, um, with general fear of the dentist. And we'll go over some specifics for how to approach individual triggers. Uh, so first, designing your practice and your office uh, to accept all genders. And the main thesis here um, is that there are a whole bunch of genders uh, it's not very important to know what someone's gender is. Now I'm going to uh, go into more information about why that might be. 
folks are happy to let you know what pronouns they use or how to best address them. Uh, keep it simple. Treat someone's pronouns as you would any other piece of demographic information. Uh, and that's it. Keep it simple. Uh, the more casual and relaxed about it uh, you are, the more that that person will feel accepted for who they are. Uh, as an example of how to approach gender uh, and pronouns, this is, um, I'm going to give two examples for situations that might not happen uh, to exhibit why um, it's pretty easy to just accept someone's pronouns for um, how they want to be addressed. So let's say you see this adorable corgi puppy scooting around. What's his name? Oh, her name's Noodles. What's the most common response that you might have to this? Hi, Noodles. Uh, it's not necessarily surprising or worrisome or confusing um, that you were told that the dog is a, um, a girl instead of a boy. Um, you know, good to know her name is Noodles. Uh, another good example, when you're meeting someone, oh, what's your name? Sarah. It'd be pretty unlikely to then say, well, actually, I think I'll call you Gwendolyn. You look more like a Gwendolyn to me. Um, so the same with pronouns. If someone uh, lets you know that um, they want to be called they, them, or maybe their pronouns are different from what you might assume on looking at them, that's just some demographic information um, that they've given you and that you can then use. You know, similarly, you might not say once you hear someone's uh, mailing address, oh, I, I think you look like someone who might live on Elm Street instead of Main Street. Just uh, accept someone's pronouns, titles, honorifics as some demographic information. That also makes life a little easier and um, can help reduce any discomfort someone might feel at being less familiar on accepting all genders to your practice. Uh, so when you're guiding your employees or yourselves or you're designing intake forms, um, the best time to ask someone what their pronouns are, and by pronouns I mean uh, he, him, she, her, they, them, uh, those are the three most common types, uh, when checking in is a great time, whether they're doing an intake demographic form or answering questions verbally, you know, has there been any changes to your insurance um, or your address, uh, what pronouns do you use? That's a great time and also what's nice about that is you can just put it on their chart and then anyone who sees their chart after that um, will know what their pronouns are while taking medical history. That's um, how we do it in my practice. Um, but whether it's that or the demographic form are both great ways. And then if someone does correct you, um, put it uh, in the chart either as a note or if there's a section on pronouns, of course, you can put that there. Uh, so just as an example, we take a verbal medical history at my office where a new patient is settled in the chair. They get a little warm neck pillow, a little drop of aromatherapy on a piece of gauze. They can choose their music. We give them little hot stones to hold. Um, and then I verbally go through a comprehensive social and medical history um, and up there with the other more just demographic straightforward answers, I just ask what pronouns they use. And that's a great way to do it. So um, it's generally, it's good to say what pronouns do you use. Uh, asking someone what their preferred pronouns are, even though that might be a very slight difference, um, someone's pronouns are what they are. So um, if you ask what they prefer, that might suggest, well, you're still gonna kind of use, you know, what you think is right. So you just wanna ask, what are your pronouns? Keep it simple. Um, one question I get asked a lot is why aren't we asking gender? Why is there no uh, gender line on the medical intake form? Um, and it's important to understand the difference between someone's anatomy and um, medical presentation and someone's gender. So even if there are questions where it's important to know, for instance, uh, if someone is pregnant, if you're going to administer nitrous oxide as an example, um, it's really useful to know if someone's pregnant. Um, rather than asking people who present as female if they're pregnant, uh, there's a few options. You can, of course, ask everyone. Um, if you're less comfortable asking someone who might present as non-female if they're pregnant, you could have a, a consent form for your nitrous. You know, um, The following people cannot use nitrous, people who are pregnant, people with advanced lung disease, etc., and ask the person, do any of these apply to you? If no, they can go ahead and sign the consent and get nitrous. Um, even in other fields like obstetrics or urology, where uh, knowing someone's anatomy might be very important, that's what you need to know, the anatomy, whatever is directly relevant for the medical setting, rather than asking, are you a man, are you a woman, you know, because there are some people who don't identify as either a man or a woman. So generally, it's important to ask everyone what their pronouns are so that you know how to address them, but not what gender they are. 
Uh, so as I said, there are many genders besides just men and women. Um, some folks might use the term non-binary or NB uh, for non-binary if they don't identify as either one. Um, and just uh, train your staff and yourselves to be more comfortable with the term they and folks instead of guys um, so that it's a normal part of your vocabulary. So especially when you're training other folks for this, um, a lot of people may ask, well, what if I keep messing up? You know, what if I 10 times in a row, I'm using the wrong pronouns, the person's starting to feel frustrated. Um, it's better to just quickly apologize. Oh, sorry, uh, they, um, as an example, um, write it down, practice verbally saying that person's pronouns out loud, maybe before their appointment so that you're more comfortable. It's good to not make a, a very big deal out of an apology. You know, oh, I'm so sorry, this is so hard for me. Um, you know, of course, try to avoid anything like, oh, well, you don't, you don't look like a she, her. Um, so just keep the apology quick and practice. That's the best way to do it. So why is it important to be accepting all genders in both medical and dental environments, especially because we're talking about equity? Um, well, it's a, it's a way to respect a person for who they are. Um, you probably wouldn't choose what someone's name is. Similarly, you may not choose um, what someone's pronouns are. Um, basic respect and welcoming. And one important thing is that people who present in non-traditional ways in all of the categories that I'll be covering, but particularly if someone presents in a way that's unexpected for appearance, for gender, um, there are a lot of barriers to care and there are higher rates of longer spaces between well visits, um, of not being able to access care. And so by showing that you're an office that is literate in being gender inclusive, a lot Lot, well, first of all, a lot of people will, will come to your particular office, will feel comfortable, and you're also helping support that person's mental health. And even if a dental environment is not the primary location for focusing on mental health, it's important that every medical environment includes social and mental health as part of someone's comprehensive medical picture. Uh, so it is important. And also by showing that you are literate in this, um, you are helping to educate the community and other providers as well. Um, another thing you can do is have signage that um, is inclusive. Notice that this says all gender restroom rather than unisex. Um, and it has a picture of a toilet, so it's obvious where one is supposed to go. This sign is a little more inclusive than something like this, which shows that um, men and women are welcome to use this restroom. But as mentioned, some people do not identify as a man or a woman. Um, so even though, you know, they can be kind of funny, uh, this, this symbol here is a little more inclusive. So uh, if you have questions, jot them down, but at the very end of both presentations, we'll be answering all questions in a Q&A. So next section, people with a history of trauma. So this can be from relationship abuse, uh, family abuse, um, psychological and financial abuse, or um, with a traumatic response to not having money or being in an impoverished situation, um, traumatic occurrences, uh, as well as that goes along with people with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and there's a similar way to approach anyone with a history of physical or emotional trauma. So one important thing to do, ask someone what their triggers are. A lot of times people are pretty aware um, of what they are most anxious about or what can trigger them. They may be particular words or phrases. It may be how the chairs lean back or how far the chairs lean back. Um, so for those folks, you may just wanna, of course, let them know when you're about to lean the chair back. Um, it could be sensory input, sudden noises and lights, uh, physical touch, um, what parts of their face or body um, might be more triggering for them, and also ask what their symptoms are for when they are triggered, because that can differ significantly from person to person. It might not be apparent that someone is experiencing um, a trauma episode or is feeling particularly anxious, so just ask them um, what that might look like. Uh, in general, approaches to people, I would say to anyone, but particularly if people have a history of trauma, is um, avoiding touching the outside of the face unless really necessary. Um, you know, see if you can palpate everything you need with blocks without um, palpating the inferior mandible. Um, during the extra oral exam, uh, maybe do more verbal questions or just give them a really specific heads up that you're going to be touching near their ears or their cheeks. Um, anything sudden without giving a heads up, I, I think that's a great rule for anyone. Um, 
especially when something's going to be very loud or you're going to change the chair position. Even if you're halfway through a procedure and they're kind of relaxed, um, if you're raising or lowering the chair, it's still important to let them know um, because that can sort of shake them out of that comfortable place they may have gotten into, you know, halfway through a lengthy ground prep. Um, the slow speed, especially anything that has a slow motor, so slow speed hand pieces um, and profi hand pieces, there's so much vibration that that will feel more intense than a high speed hand piece or a cavitron. So always give a heads up with any instrument that you're using that has a slow motor. Um, and just be, you know, as professional as you normally are, but um, some folks who may have a history, particularly of relationship violence, might feel uncomfortable with diminutive words like honey or sweetie. So um, in general, just be aware of that. Um, and also, um, people with a history of trauma are more likely um, to have certain types of mental health concerns and more likely to have uh, low self-esteem, both of which are barriers to care and barriers to self-care. Um, so it's very important as dental professionals to really try to remove judgment from your practice in general. Though we try our best to be welcoming, there is a tendency to see someone who's high risk with a lot of plaque, um, uh, you know, rampant decay or um, obvious signs of, of neglect and feel somewhat judgmental towards that person. The single most complaint that patients have on why a previous dental setting was a negative experience is that they were lectured or judged. Not that it was painful, not that it was expensive, um, not that they didn't trust their dentist, those are all reasons, but specifically that they were made to feel bad for coming in. Um, and it's our job to treat folks, the high risk, moderate and low risk people, if they are in the chair and have an enormous amount of decay or a lot of buildup, that's great. Uh, it was very difficult to you know, make the appointment and get comfortable in a new setting. Uh, just welcome them and be thrilled that they're there. Um, um, and people with a history of trauma, since there may be a correlation with lower self-esteem, they may be extra sensitive to feeling like they're not doing a good job brushing. Um, you know, episodes of depression are associated with a decrease in self-care and with oral hygiene. Um, so just be positive. Maybe avoid oral hygiene instructions at all until their second visit so you can establish a good relationship. Um, and be patient. Folks may feel bad that they need some extra time or extra explanation. Um, so just, you know, extend some kindness there and try to be educational, supportive, and positive rather than telling them they did the wrong thing by not going to the dentist for a while because that's not productive. They're here now, you can start that relationship. Um, and it is important to have flyers. I recommend the restroom for numbers that people can call if they're experiencing relationship violence. Um, you know, QR codes that they can take a picture with their phone, something that's in a private space um, to have resources um, in case they're having issues now or may know someone who is. So people who are uh, housing or food insecure um, might, there might be a variety of backgrounds for why someone may have difficulty purchasing food or finding housing. Um, it may be from um, not having enough money financially. It may be a transitional point. The person could have been recently, um, recently incarcerated. Um, the person might be in recovery from addiction, um, maybe leaving home for the first time, a variety of reasons. Um, but it's very easy to add a single question in your um, general health history or in your demographic information. And the dental setting is an appropriate place to ask for this because you are trying to present the dental home as a branch of someone's comprehensive medical home. Even if you're a small private practice, that's what we are, or a large community health center, um, it's important to ask about everything, including social history. So we generally ask, do you need help in purchasing food or groceries? Uh, do you have a safe place to live? Two very easy questions that you can ask and add to your form. And then um, if they do say that they need some help, maybe have some uh, printed and electronic uh, resources ready. Um, I usually just send an email that has um, links to all of the local food pantries or brown bag locations, um, shelter information that can also be posted in your restroom, um, or maybe have something that you can print and fold up in a plain envelope and just hand to them. Um, and, you know, 
be cautious that um, if someone might be um, experiencing relationship violence or currently doesn't have a safe place to live, um, to be aware of that and how you may approach that differently um, than if someone is, you know, food insecure and just needs some links to um, access to groceries or food. Uh, so just to keep in mind um, why someone might not currently be in a stable situation, they could have been recently incarcerated, recovering from addiction, um, recently leaving an abusive situation, uh, students, newly graduated students, you know, don't just assume that um, a patient who might use Medicaid for their insurance or who may present as um, being in a difficult spot um, uh, financially or economically might not need resources. It's a good question to ask everyone. All right, moving right along. So people with disabilities, um, mobility and sensory impairment, so blind people, um, deaf people, um, among others, in general, uh, what to approach with folks with sensory disabilities. Is your office ADA accessible? So usually that refers to the cant and the length of ramps, um, if there's elevator access, um, if, there, you know, if there are stairs, um, even if there's a step or two in front of the office. Um, that in general is important um, for people with mobility impairment, but people who are deaf or blind or have hearing impairment or vision impairment, um, there are certain um, approaches in the ADA laws to make sure to look at. Uh, one thing to note for people who are deaf or hard of hearing um, is that that's the uh, ASL is the only language that um, or whatever sign language that person speaks that the office does have to pay for and hire the interpreter. Uh, and just as a heads up, it can take six to seven weeks to book an ASL interpreter that's comfortable with the dental setting. So if you know that a patient is coming in who's deaf, um, it's good to have a list of numbers for local interpreters and there's several schools of the deaf or um, different programs and I'm happy to share my resources about who to call for that. And you would then uh, book the interpreter. So the, the office has to hire an interpreter. Uh, and then for some people who also use movement of the mouth uh, to communicate, um, it might be a good idea to lower the mask. Just ask the person in what way uh, can we make the office accessible for you. Don't assume that every deaf person might read lips, um, but just ask. Folks are very happy to let you know um, what they need for communication. Uh, for blind patients, um, they need to consent. So if you have a general consent or a procedural consent, um, if they use a screen reader and all of your forms are electronic, uh, just note that those forms have to be in text. Um, so a lot of offices, especially converting to an electronic office from a paper one, might have scanned images of consent forms. Um, and just be cautious, a lot of those end up as JPEGs or image forms, which are not accessible by screen readers. Um, a good rule is if you can select text, it is accessible. A lot of Word documents and PDFs, you can select the text. If you can't select it, it's usually an image and not acceptable, not accessible, excuse me. So um, have as many electronic forms as possible. If you are a paper only office, um, it, you may need to verbally read everything um, or have a, um, you know, an online backup that you can email that individual person who can then use it with a screen reader. Um, if they're signing a signature form, um, it should be obvious by palpation where this uh, signing begins. So if it's a large um, screen or a tablet um, and it might not be obvious, you can put two pieces of tape at 90 degrees, you know, right where the signature is supposed to start and direct the person to uh, feel the tape and start right in that corner. Um, and that's usually helpful. Um, if someone, oh, of course, verbal warnings, um, if someone might be deaf or blind um, about what's going to happen, touch, chair position, things like that. Just keep that in mind. Ask the person how they want to be indicated if you need to get their attention. Um, might be a light tap on the, sh on the shoulder. Um, but again, just like we talked about before, you know, tapping someone on the, on the cheek or the chin might not be appropriate. So just chat with them. Ask what is needed. Communication is so important here. For animals who are working, um, ignore the animal completely. Uh, you can um, ask the patient um, if your animal is in the way, you know, if it's sitting on the rheostat, um, 
do I instruct you for where the animal goes? Just ask the person uh, for what's needed. Be careful to not say the, um, the animal's name um, and just check in with the patient about what's needed for that, uh, but ignore the, the service animal completely. Um, for interpreters, make sure you're making eye contact with the patient rather than the interpreter. Um, and that's uh, not only with sign language, but verbal languages as well. Um, and do not grab someone's elbow, uh, help assume that someone needs help uh, getting up or getting down in the chair. Uh, don't assume a blind person uh, wishes to be led. If someone um, wants assistance, of course, offer it. You can ask, is there anything I can help you with right now? But be very careful to not um, just start touching or moving a patient without their consent. One other thing to keep in mind, uh, if someone is using a wheelchair, how do they indicate that they've arrived? Um, if there aren't elevators or, or if the um, office is accessible but the door isn't automatic, do they call the office? If so, is the phone number put on the outside of the door so they can see? If they knock on the door, will someone hear? Is there a doorbell? Just keep in mind, start to finish from entering the space, um, is it accessible for people? So um, it is always okay to ask a person what they need for your office to be accessible. People with cognitive disabilities, um, if they are not their own guardian, it's important to get paperwork both um, for who the guardian is and then to send all of your office consents to the guardian. And you aren't able to see the patient until all of those forms are signed. Uh, what we do in my office is we actually send every procedure consent to the guardian um, to have them look at and sign it and explain to them, you know, we're not doing all these procedures in the first visit, but if you obtain consent beforehand, you can then do a quick Quick phone call or phone consent to say, oh, you know, today we are doing the root canal. I have your consent here. You know, is it all right to proceed? Um, remember that a, um, a staff member or a group home member um, is not necessarily the guardian, so they aren't able to sign consent forms, even if they're the only person accompanying the patient. Um, and then if the patient is verbal, you can ask them um, what you know, their approach, uh, what their preferred approach is at the dental office. If they're nonverbal, you can then ask the staff or, or caregiver um, the best way to approach. Um, and remember, people with cognitive disabilities, um, whatever the history, traumatic brain injury, um, innate, and every other type, um, can vary a lot in presentation and in communication abilities. Uh, and then if you're noticing that someone in a group home um, may need more help with um, oral care, that it's very, very common to um, offer further instructions or even write an order um, that goes home with the paperwork about how and when to brush, um, if an electric brush is needed, you know, whatever um, uh, is accessible and needed for that patient. Um, you can actually write an order like a prescription and that then has to be followed at the group home. They're very good with paperwork. Um, and so it's important that that's written down somewhere. So people with autism, um, I would not include that in your medical history form under the category of disabilities. A lot of people who have autism um, don't consider themselves disabled. Um, so that could be a separate question. Um, for people with autism, familiarity is often helpful, particularly for younger patients with autism, with children. Um, so if there's a tour online of the office, you know, send that to the family beforehand. Let them know which provider they'll be seeing so that that's familiar. Um, and for, especially for younger children, and if the first visit, you know, if they don't even go into the room or, um, you know, they yell a lot when being lowered into the chair, I find that more frequent desensitization visits are very, very helpful for people with autism. So you can schedule an every two week or every month visit. Um, and in terms of billing, you can select one thing that you did on that visit, like fluoride only, limited exam only, one bite wing only. Um, and thus, um, you know, a lot of offices ask how to get compensation for a monthly um, or biweekly visit. Um, just bill one procedure that you focused on for that day. There's also a behavioral management code. Um, 
or you know some visits could be out of pocket but frequent short desensitization visits are very very helpful um, and for folks who do have autism some people um, might think that the patient is upset or or not um, going along with the treatment or is disappointed at an outcome um, but the affect might differ from person to person um, so go in that case more by what the person is saying verbally um, rather than assuming that um, that the communication uh, road might not be as open as you thought. All right, and then finally, um, people with dental phobia. Phobia is pretty universal. Uh, the types of triggers are not. So just keep in mind that people can vary significantly in what specifically they are afraid of at the dentist. Um, and here is a list of triggers that not only multiple patients uh, have reported, but interestingly, a lot of people think that their trigger is universal. So uh, dental phobia is relatively universal. Specific triggers are not. Assumption that triggers are shared is. So of course, pain is one. Needles as a separate phobia. Um, vibration, primarily with the slow speed, but with any types of handpiece, hygiene handpiece and cavitron. Sensory input, which is pretty intense in the dental environment. Um, feeling like you can't breathe or can't swallow. The general invasiveness of having someone's face close to yours, of having hands in the mouth. Copays and fees, especially if in the past the person felt like they were at an office um, with less than transparent policies on that. Um, a general feeling of the slippery slope towards mortality that people worry about. Um, that's very common if someone's restorations all tend to fail at around the same time. They may feel like their whole mouth is falling apart. Um, and that's a good opportunity to educate them um, that, oh, all these restorations were done at the same time. So they're, they're now failing at the same time. Um, shame is a huge one. Negative experiences from previous dental offices um, and not being um, identified or respected as a person. And so your approach to all of these might be very, very different depending on what the trigger is. And it certainly can be uh, emotionally tiring at each hour of the day to modify your whole rhetoric to um, approach these triggers, but it makes a huge difference. So um, I can, I sometimes observe that some dental providers sort of have this, um, uh, cookie cutter approach. Well, I know that patients are anxious, so I'm going to speak slowly, you know, let them know what I'm going to do before I do it and, um, and speak with a certain voice. But different people might, that might actually not work for someone. Um, so it's really important to, to read the room in this case. And also patients might not present in a way that you're that you are used to uh, when they are feeling anxious. So some people might stop communicating and get very quiet, but might not be relaxed. Um, they might present as angry when they're really just feeling vulnerable. They may, um, you know, say they're not happy with the dental work or, you know, say you're not a good hygienist or they may just be feeling anxious. Uh, they may shake or tremble, crying, uh, over talking or under talking. Um, you know, watch their hands and knuckles to see if they're gripping the chair. Maybe give them something to hold, like we give um, uh, smooth stones and people really appreciate having something to hold on to. Um, some people might, you know, you may think they're, they're not being present with you because they're constantly looking at their phone. That might be a distraction from their anxiety. Um, or, you know, people really observing what's going on. Every time you get an instrument, oh, what's that? Or trying to sit up a lot. Um, that may be, you know, trying to get control of a situation that feels very outside of their control. So um, presentations might be very, very different from person to person. Apologizing for having dental issues in the first place. Um, so I would recommend, um, as always with open communication, asking what their triggers are. In general, have you had any negative experiences in the past? What specifically about procedures tends to make you anxious? And then what can I do to help? Um, it's really interesting how different everyone's responses are. Um, before I start a procedure, it's also a great idea to ask, do you like a lot of talking while I'm working or less talking? Um, make sure you're not talking about the person over them while you're working, you know, to your assistant. Um, I recommend talking as little as possible once the work gets started. Um, but just ask in general, what specifically tends to make them anxious? Do you want to hear a lot about what I'm doing? Do you want a narrative of this procedure, um, which often can help people feel like they're more in control? 
Uh, so in general, people who are anxious or have described themselves as being anxious, um, don't let them, you know, stay back in the chair with the light and, you know, the dental dam in and light on their face. Whenever you can, sit them up, let them take a breath, welcome them to poke their phones, have a rinse by the sink, um, let them know when they can take a break. Um, uh, while the anesthesia is working, I would recommend leaving the room so they don't feel stared at. A watched tooth never numbs. I always say that. Um, welcome them to distract themselves with a book from the waiting room or a phone. Um, and then at the end, um, before you start giving a whole bunch of instructions for what you just did, just give them a moment to recover, let them rinse, let them sit in the chair, maybe say, oh, I'm gonna grab something next door, just let them have a few breaths. I strongly recommend collecting all copays um, at the beginning of the appointment and having them sign everything then so that when they're finished, they can just kind of leave and collapse and recover um, so that they're not you know, fumbling for their credit card um, while um, feeling really shaken up after what's just happened. Sometimes people tend to really sort of cry more when the appointment's finished because all of that tension is being released. That's especially common after the nitrous wears off. If you use nitrous oxide, um, it's very normal for the person to actually present as more upset when everything's all finished. So just adapt to particular anxieties. If someone is nervous about injections, you know, lots of topical or distraction, do the maxillary teeth first before you get to the block, use nitrous just for local maybe. Um, if they're feeling like all of their, you know, they've been fine for 10 years and need a significant amount of care, um, they may feel that their body is falling apart the light bulb analogy is, um, you know, when one, growing up, if one light bulb was out, my mom always made me change all of the ones in the house because we probably put them in at the same time. And if you don't do that, then, you know, every few days, another light bulb's going to go out. So um, if you see one or two restorations failing that seem to be done around the same time, prepare them that they may end up needing a lot of crowns in the next few years. And it's not from not taking care of themselves. Um, remove blame, talk about risk factors they both can and cannot control. Um, remember that people with excellent oral hygiene and low oral carbohydrates may still be high risk. And there's other factors, pH and xerostomia and genetics and everything that um, can help reduce shame. Um, if someone has had negative experiences with trusting their previous dental providers, maybe warn them that at the next recall, they might need a lot of fillings. That's the six month heads up. You know, if someone has five or six, uh, you know, class two lesions just into the, into the dentin, you might want to defer the restorations until the, the next visit so that they know there was a heads up and that, oh, all of a sudden you're, you know, treatment planning six fillings, um, you know, really, cater your approach to, um, to helping them build long-term trust um, with vibration. Always encourage folks to listen to their own music or their own podcasts. Earbuds won't really get in the way. Maybe use the high speed more so they don't feel the vibration of the slow speed as much. Really give them a verbal heads up when you're going to do that. Basically just adapt to what they're specifically worried about. Okay, so feel free to jot down my email if you have any questions. Um, I'm going to hand it off to our next speaker, but I'll be around at the end for any Q&A. And thank you so much for joining today. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Wagner. That was great. Um, and again, we'll be taking questions at the end of both presentations. So please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to submit a question. Uh, now I'd like to go ahead and welcome Dr. Alec Edelman, and he will be presenting on designing an effective and modern oral health and wellness resources for vaping. Uh, Dr. Edelman completed his dental and public health training at Tufts University before doing his general practice residency, residency at Harvard, um, and he's now with Cambridge Health Alliance, and he's currently a master teacher fellow teaching at Harvard Medical and Dental Schools. Thank you. Take it away. Hello everyone, and uh, welcome here to our next edition with this Oral Health Equity Summit. It's a great privilege to be here, and I want to thank everyone for taking time out of their Friday, wherever you may be, doing whatever you may be doing. I uh, hope you are well and uh, well supported. Um, and so today we're going to be talking about a, a nice topic that 
I've been getting a lot of questions about and certainly has uh, a lot of thoughts on people's minds on what are really the implications for what uh, vaping might have for the oral cavity and as well as overall health. Um, and so just to prime people, uh, today's discussion will be a little bit less heavy on what is the actual health effects from vaping, but how can we actually talk about this discussion with some of the most vulnerable populations right now that are susceptible to this, which are the youth and adolescents. And so some of the ideas that we're going to be framing our discussion around are understanding how this current crisis really came to be. Uh, it's going to be a nice overview of actually from the same perspective that I took when uh, I've been doing a lot of this oral health promotional activities with middle school age children, whether they're be from age 12 to about 18 or so, uh, which goes up to high school, and trying to understand it from their perspective. And we're going to have a lot of comparisons, uh, understanding what are some of the similarities and differences between uh, vaping uh, e-cigarettes and what are the, the common risks for cigarettes and what we have taken from that from a long range of time for the study and evidence and applying it to what this new uh, crisis is happening, which is not very lengthy as far as how much evidence we have to support it. And then I would also like to spend some, some nice time discussing how do we design our oral health promotion activities for this, uh, wellness activities to be able to meet these youth on their level. Um, and I think that that's where I'd like to spend a lot of our time. And so uh, without uh, further ado, I would like to say, as far as disclosures go, um, there's not much to go in the way for this, but I, it is going to be from the, the mindset of having a lot of these presentations given to the actual um, uh, middle school and high school age. So this is a little bit more detailed outline of what we're going to be going into, uh, going into an actual description of the crisis uh, from a nice informational video that we'll be uh, playing in just a moment. Uh, it, like I had said, uh, comparing and contrasting to other substances, uh, giving an update from the systemic and oral health. Uh, what are some other current trends that are being utilized for adolescent health techniques uh, for other topics outside of vaping and e-cigarettes for that substance use? Uh, and I will be giving some information about the, um, the program I delivered to one of the public uh, middle schools here in the Massachusetts greater Boston area before our interactive activity, which will be utilizing the poll, uh, the Zoom poll function, just as we used in the beginning, and then as well taking some um, home advice for everyone to hopefully have something to understand. And so at first we're gonna start with an informational video, which is a great media technique to talking with youth because this is really the, the central focus for how this crisis has come to be. been smoking for at least 7,000 years, but it wasn't until the 1800s that cigarettes became the smoke of choice after machines were developed to mass produce them. 200 years later, in 2003, the electronic cigarette was invented in China, and since then the use of e-cigarettes, also called vaping, has grown exponentially around the world. E-cigarettes are electronic devices that vaporize a flavored liquid. They all used to look like cigarettes, but now they come in many shapes and sizes. Many look like pens or small boxes called mods. What they all have in common is, one, a power source, usually a lithium battery. Two, an atomizer, which heats the e-liquid. Three, e-liquid or e-juice, which usually contains flavors of nicotine. And four, a cartridge or tank, which is filled with e-liquid. Heating the e-liquid creates a cloud of vapor that looks like smoke, but without a lot of the lethal components contained in tobacco smoke. Many people assume e-cigarettes are safer than traditional cigarettes because they don't burn anything or create tar in your lungs. But it took almost 7,000 years for humans to realize that tobacco causes lung cancer, throat and mouth cancer, causes heart attacks and strokes, and damages the lungs. E-cigs, meanwhile, have only been around a little over a decade, so there just hasn't been enough time to figure out what effects they'll have on your body. We do know that e-cigarettes deliver nicotine, just like the traditional cigarettes, causing increased heart rate and blood pressure. Nicotine also has powerful effects on the brain. It releases rewarding neurotransmitters in the brain, like dopamine, and changes brain chemistry. It is a stimulant, making people feel more alert, but when it goes away, people crave it even more. It can interfere with the body's own natural ability to make dopamine, and soon the user needs nicotine just to feel normal. The developing brain of teenagers is the most vulnerable to these effects. The powerful addictive nature of nicotine is so high that it's comparable to heroin and cocaine. Besides nicotine, e-cigarettes contain chemical solvents. When heated very high by some of the new e-cigarette devices, these solvents can be transformed into formaldehyde, which is a carcinogen. 
it causes cancer. These observations are concerning, but we really do not know what the long-term effects from inhaling these chemicals in your lungs would be. E-cigs contain many other chemicals to generate enticing flavors. In fact, there are almost 8,000 different flavors available today, so we don't know very much about many of them. We do know that some of the butter flavorings contain diacetyl, which is famous for causing popcorn lung. Popcorn lung is a disease called bronchiolitis obliterans, which is basically an irreversible scarring and destruction of the delicate lung tissue that can kill you. Strawberry and other healthy sounding fruit flavors have been found to be cytotoxic and potentially cancer causing as well. Vaping devices, or specifically the lithium batteries inside them, may explode unpredictably. Although uncommon, this happens frequently enough that e-cigarettes have been banned from luggage on airplanes. Unpredictable explosions have occurred in people's faces and mouths and resulted in serious injuries, including blindness. With these potential risks of e-cigarettes, the addictive nicotine, the exploding batteries, the carcinogenic liquids, why would any company want you to use them? Sales of e-cigarettes approach $8 billion per year and are increasing. The truth is tobacco cigarettes kill about 50% of people who use them. So tobacco companies known as Big Tobacco need to keep recruiting young people to become addicted in order to stay in business. Here are some actual documented quotes from tobacco executives. We don't smoke that shit. we just sell it. We reserve the right to smoke for the young, the poor, and the stupid. The base of our business is the high school student. The fragile self-image of the young person needs all the support it can get. Smoking may appear to enhance that self-image. Studies show that when people start to smoke in their teens, they become addicted and stay smokers as they grow older. Even those who swear they will never become addicted. Many of the same strategies that Big Tobacco used to hook your grandparents into smoking tobacco cigarettes simply are being used today with an ease of a tobacco cig. E-cigarettes come in candy and dessert flavors like Skittles, gummy bears, and vanilla cupcake, directly aimed at teens. Ads always show thin, beautiful people vaping. Even the strategic use of humor is being successfully used to get customers on their side. The bottom line is that we are all faced with important personal choices every day. We don't yet know everything we need to know to make informed decisions about many things, but we can resist being manipulated. Take your time when making your own personal decisions. It can make all the difference. And so one of the main reasons why I wanted to show this lengthy video is the actual message and technique that they use for delivering this type of overall synopsis for vaping to teens. Uh, one of the more important ideas and principles behind pedagogy, which is the teaching to children, is to be able to meet them on their level. And so what might be considered sometimes the traditional format for learning for adults, such as to go through a PowerPoint presentation, to be given a handout, to be giving all these different resources, most likely will not work as effectively for someone that's a middle school and high school age. And so what they're able to use is appropriate language, themes, specific for their target audience. Uh, as you were able to see, hopefully from that video, it was quite captivating. And it goes from essentially kind of a A to Z of how we got to this standpoint. Uh, and it also touches upon what they are able to understand from their own exposures. Uh, as far as the marketing strategies they are concerned, uh, some of the health discussions that were brought up, um, themes such as addiction, lung health, other things like that. Um, surprisingly, when I was in these different um, middle school and high school age uh, classrooms, they have a pretty well-developed understanding for some of how the body might work. And I think that this might be some of where uh, we're meeting this new age for developing health promotional materials, is to not necessarily underestimate uh, the knowledge and skills and abilities for these, un uh, these underserved communities and these com um, high school and middle school age students. Uh, that they do have the, uh, the ability to process a lot more information for this to be able to understand. And I'll get into this detail a little bit, learning, a little bit later on. Uh, but some of the specific things that they are, were able to understand more comprehensively were that some of these chemicals that are inside of these vaping products are not necessarily well understood and we don't necessarily know all the different health effects that they might have. And taking information that we do understand such as with nicotine, marketing, and other different types of advertising approaches and try to deliver the message through those. And one thing I do want to bring some attention to from the end of that video is that they leave the end open to discussion. It's not being hard and fast, black and white of, we don't want you to vape, stop vaping, it is bad for you. 
it's leaving it more up to the interpretation for the under uh, the the younger person, the youth um, that this is targeted to. And that's a really important theme that we're going to touch upon a little bit later, as far as trying to impact the decisions and reasoning behind why they would make a healthy behavior change to stop vaping or to never vape in the first place. And so I want to get into a little bit more of some of the comparisons between what we have been witnessing with e-cigarettes and cigarettes. And just to reframe one more time, e-cigarettes, vaping, juuling are all considered somewhat of the same idea. They are different brand names to the same idea of product, which is using an e-liquid to be vaporized in this actual vessel uh, to be um, inhaled. And so some of the common platforms that we were seeing for advertising for cigarettes, TVs, news, uh, on, uh, not necessarily online too long ago, but in magazine print, in newspaper print, movies, where they're seeing role models, other people that they look up to. Uh, nowadays, it's really all seen on social media and in video games. And we'll go into a few more specifics on what those might look like. Uh, as far as the actual messaging, uh, self-image, trying to elevate your social status, relieving stress, were some of the same constants that are being seen between cigarettes and e-cigarettes. Uh, the one thing that we are seeing that most of us maybe in the adulthood are, we might have been exposed to this marketing strategy, is that it's healthier than cigarettes. That is, vaping is healthier than cigarettes. Now, this is a really interesting point that I do like to talk about with the, um, the middle and high school age students because this is something that they've seen. Um, and to be, under, to be able to understand this, it's critical that the students do understand, yes, cigarettes we know are really terrible for you, and here's all the reasons why. Um, to be able to say e-cigarettes may not be as bad as cigarettes and trying to say that just because something is better than one of the worst things doesn't necessarily make it good. And this is one of the key topics that we try to elaborate in on with the individual uh, programming. Uh, and then the targeting population, it's very interesting that the messages really separate are, there are different target messages depending on the uh, target audience for what they're trying to say within these advertisements. Uh, originally when e-cigarettes came out, they were targeted much more for uh, those that are trying to uh, wean off of their cigarette habits and trying to get onto something that is healthier. Um, but when they realized that that market was only one piece of the pie, this is the e-cigarette companies, they expanded their other things to their other marketing strategies to be able to focus in on those other populations that the, the video began to touch upon. And so let's try to understand a little bit of who this has been impacting. Um, over the years, cigarette campaigns for trying to stop uh, teens and adolescents from beginning to smoke cigarettes has been highly effective. And we've been seeing decreases in, um, in youth that have uh, been traditionally been getting addicted to smoking cigarettes from an earlier standpoint. However, in the last 10 years, we have seen that e-cigarettes has been a much larger proportion of what has been um, addict, uh, what has been abused by the teen population. And there are major uh, disparities among the racial and ethnic groups for this. And so this is within cigarettes from the CDC. And in just a moment, we'll go into e-cigarettes too. Uh, but I do want to really highlight that despite all the major successes that public health has done for cigarette health education and the success for trying to stop from youth and teens from being becoming addicted, unfortunately, a lot of those gains have been erased with the e-cigarettes. And quite interestingly enough, and this hasn't been really as well supported as far as new information, but when the vaping bans were instituted at the end of 2019, starting in, I believe, about October, November, and going further than that, when there was a national vaping crisis before this current crisis that we're in, um, it was a very interesting thing that we began seeing where uh, a lot of uh, individuals that were addicted to the nicotine in the vaping products were unfortunately trying to find products that had that nicotine too. And so we did begin to see an uprise, an uptick in the, um, the amount of youth trying to have uh, cigarettes to be able to, to meet that, uh, that need and threshold for, the, uh, for nicotine. And so here's a little bit more information about uh, who are being currently uh, uh, abusing these different uh, e-cigarette products. And so this was recent information from the CDC uh, from 2018 that had showed that there is different disparities among racial and ethnic groups for who are actually being addicted the most and who are using them the most. I uh, did want to read this quote that we found that many of the same features used decades ago by the tobacco industry to appeal to youth such as social status, appearance, and celebrity are being used in current East US e-cigarette ads, raising the concern that exposure to such marketing like exposure to tobacco products before it may influence 
influence development of positive youth attitudes and initiation of product use, which is just exactly the same um, principles that we were just discussing. And unfortunately, like so many other comorbidities that might happen, there are racial and ethnic um, uh, predispositions to being a little bit more addicted to this uh, material. And so we're not going to go into all the details leading up to this, but it is critically important to recognize that those vulnerable populations are even more susceptible to potentially being um, abusing and using these uh, devices at an earlier age. And so what this presentation is really trying to get at is how do we create the health promotion materials to be able to meet them in the similar combative ways to how they're trying to be um, exposed to it. And like I was saying before, that marketing strategy has been from these different social media platforms where they're utilizing all different types of media. And so different places where that media is being seen highly at this point is Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, not as much Twitter. There's this new uh, platform called TikTok, um, just to keep everyone up to date on different things. PlayStation, Netflix. When I was discussing this with middle school students, and trying to kind of present different opportunities for them to understand what marketing strategy might look like, they weren't necessarily as aware that someone vaping in a video game is actually exposing them to that different um, behavior in a uh, kind of a, a subliminal way and trying to understand the importance for why they would do that. There are a lot of unfortunate other marketing techniques that are being used and this is one of the hardest and most difficult parts for school health officials to be on top of, which is that devices are being hidden. Um, at this point, we, we don't know exact numbers for how many people have either, or middle schoolers have used it, or high schoolers, um, or tried it, or who are chronically using it, but it's a very high percentage and constantly increasing, unfortunately, at this point. Um, but they're hiding it in their sweatshirts. A lot of them, unfortunately, are hiding it inside of their undergarments, uh, such as their shoes, um, in their underwear, other things like that, to be able to size it and go into the bathroom and share and obviously at this current crisis where, where there's a respiratory disease going around, this is even more of an important topic to be able to help these youth to understand that there's a lot of underlying risks that we'll get into in just a moment and you might not want to do this. And so there is, there's other marketing strategies such as challenges and different flavors, which uh, the teens are now being addicted to such as sugar flavorings added to the e-liquid. And so what are some of the actual health effects for this? I do want to make some, uh, bring some attention to this. Uh, and when I start this discussion with uh, the students, one of the first questions I ask them is, how many people have heard that vaping is bad for you? And unanimously, almost everyone in the class will raise their hand. And then I ask a follow-up question, which is, has anyone explained to you why vaping might not be a good thing for your health? and very few people will actually raise their hand. And this is something that they latch onto. They want to understand more. Um, and they're, they're very fearful for this, very anxious about it, because they have heard mixed messaging, where their friends and maybe peers are saying one thing, and then their authority figures are saying another. And I ask them, well, if someone caught you vaping, what would happen? And they understand that there are consequences, but if they don't feel those and don't understand those to the full extent, it might not be internalized as much, and they may not result in the healthy behavior change. And so some of the key things that are really, really important to touch upon when designing these oral health or general health promotion materials for vaping is understanding we, we know what nicotine can do to the, uh, the, the oral cavity, to the systemic cavity, as far as it can dry your mouth out more, it can lead to addiction. Uh, the volatile organic compounds, there's one specific uh, material called acetone, which can be found in e-liquid. Um, and the, the interesting point is when we compare Acetone is the same ingredient that is used for fingered um, nail polish remover. The room gasps. And when they understand that connection, they're all very worried that that is one of the chemicals that's inside of it. And then another one of the things that I do love to really hone in on being a dentist is um, trying to understand to them how many different flavors they are, there are in vaping products. And I ask them, do you think that a real strawberry was made or used to make this e-liquid? And almost none of them think that that was actually the case. And they understand it's an artificial chemical. And then when I say to them, what do you think is in that? And I tell them it might be sugar. Most of them have some preliminary understanding that sugar can lead to lots of different health effects, whether it be diabetes, whether it be um, different uh, cardiovascular problems, but they also might understand that it can lead to cavities and other things of that nature. 
And if you chronically are coating your teeth with an e-liquid that has sugar in it, this is one of the more well-known things that we do have at this point to understand that that is not great for your oral health and your overall health. So why? Why are these teens doing this? And so this is a figure that um, I have adopted from cigarette um, campaign knowledge of trying to experiment, have fun, to relax, to meet with their stress needs. They're very stressed um, youth these days from all across the board. Uh, to feel good, to fit in with people, to experiment. They're bored. Students almost unanimously say that they're bored and trying to find negative, identify the negative coping mechanisms and reinforce the positive ones. And so we obviously want to say that if the vaping is a negative one, what's a positive one? Trying to go outside, have fun with your friends, watch a TV show, watch a movie, interact with your friends and family in other ways. And so trying to be very specific with what you can do to substitute some of these negative behaviors. Um, and I do want to take this moment to actually address some of the, the, um, the differences between what might uh, have been the campaign's uh, message for a lot of us, um, DARE, Drug Abuse Resistance Education, and what were some of the, the key topics behind the Just Say No campaign, and trying to take it another step further without causing too much criticism on those um, previous public health campaigns, but we also are recognizing and acknowledging that we are in a different age. Social media has changed the way we do almost everything across the life. And I will say that it is going to be a, it's one of the reasons that led to this major crisis for vaping, but it's also similarly most likely going to be one of the ways that we can combat it. And so what we're trying to do is trying to identify those different ways. And so there's been some wonderful national and international campaigns that texting a, a phone line, a quit line, texting Ditch Jewel to this truth initiative, um, it's 88709. And wonderfully, I when I asked uh, the um, middle school and high school age students, a lot of them have been exposed to these types of materials. And I wanted to share what actually resonates really well with them for what might be what those videos look like. All right, we're ready. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Okay, bye. So just to reinforce again, the reason why I want to be showing these different um, videos, interactive media is because they are effective. They are designed to be targeted. They are designed to uh, be on the same level for these um, susceptible youth that are undergoing this youth crisis and trying to increase the exposure. It's one thing to be given an advertisement when you can change the channel, tune out, do something else. But when you have the students sitting down in their classroom, it's a whole different experience for them all to be watching and all to be able to be interacting and engaging with that video in a much higher level. And so I wanted to bring about one of the uh, quotes from the CDC Director Office for um, Smoking and Health. Uh, we know smoke-free policies, hard-hitting media campaigns, high prices for tobacco products, and promotion of cessation treatment in clinical settings are proven to reduce tobacco product use. Um, if fully implemented and enforced, these strategies could help to reduce tobacco use, particularly among racial and ethnic populations with higher rates of use. And so what, that's one of the key components and what we wanted to try to do here today was to increase the exposure to our public health pro professionals to be able to understand some of these really well-developed materials and not necessarily to use the phrase reinventing the wheel, but finding ways to implement them. And so one of the contexts that we do want to be able to um, kind of frame this all in is adolescent health. And adolescent health is not necessarily something that all of us, if we're routinely seeing patients in the dental office, necessarily have in the forefront of our mind. Um, I think a lot of us will understand that it is actually rather difficult to get an adolescent into the chair, into your office at a family medicine practice. Um, it's very difficult to reach them. And it's the same um, techniques that are, it's the same understanding of this principle that they are very hard to, um, to captivate. Uh, that is unfortunately what we have to use and understand in order to develop these materials. And so whether it's using the right language, um, meeting their needs for what they do need, if they don't have the resources such as technology, uh, transportation, all these kinds of social determinants of health to be able to access these materials, we need to understand that we can hopefully provide those resources to them. And understanding cultural targeting as far as if it needs to be in a different language, if it needs to be at a different learning level, uh, depending on what the age of them are, uh, it's really important to be able to tailor this as much as we can. 
And so it's all about delivering this person-centered care uh, for adolescent health. And so just to touch upon the adolescent health piece a little bit more um, comprehensively, uh, this is some guidance that was delivered from the World Health Organization that um, adopts a lot of different domains when developing different protocols for uh, having adolescent health. And just to define what adolescent health may be, I want to provide that in this top corner up here. Um, we're referring to the requirements for understanding healthy adolescent development, the breadth of contributions to adolescent health, where it's the intersection of biological development with social and structural determinants, the common health issues experienced and the range of preventive interventions that address these health issues. Um, and just as I was alluding to before, where one of the major problems that a lot of these youth are really dealing with is high stress levels and trying to find different stress coping mechanisms, it's really important for us to try to recognize that and to bring those resources to them and to be very cognizant that um, not everyone might have the same understanding as far as what the youth may be for being able to access these materials. Um, and so while they may be um, prior, uh, success for a lot of the preventative techniques for early on in childhood, at youth, when you're experimenting, when you are trying different things, um, we do want to recognize that there might be some increased uh, attention that we can give to providing refreshing courses for those different health risks that they're at at this point. Specifically, um, vaping, other things like that, sexual health, all different things that we can really bring attention to within the adolescent health domain. And if you can read kind of sideways here, one of the most important things for this is effective communication. And so I wanted to share some of the materials that I actually had learned from my, um, my middle school and high school age uh, classes. And we were able to deliver a survey, a post activity survey to these students to understand what's the takeaway and also what would you have liked to see more of? And so I'll actually start with this, what would you have liked to see more of question? And it's very interesting that almost the entirety of my presentation, uh, it, it involves very little text and almost exclusively videos, pictures, diagrams, figures to be able to present to them. And almost all of them had said more video and pictures. Another one is actually more understanding for the health effects. And so while we paid specific attention to their cardiovascular health by telling them, well, if you're having some difficulty breathing, such as if you have asthma, wouldn't it be not necessarily as great for your health if your lungs, which are the primary um, recipient for inhaling the vaping materials, were not as healthy to be able to deal with that? And then once that is absorbed through your lungs, many of the students understand that it is disseminated into your bloodstream. And so that cardiovascular health, the pulmonary health, all tied in together, they very much respond to the idea of, do I want to be putting something into my body that is unknown, potentially very harmful, and one of the ways I frame this is, I think, a very helpful way, which is asking a 13-year-old, is this how you would like your body to be in 10 years from now? And trying to understand that uh, they're still developing and they want to still be developing and asking them, would you rather have control over your development or lack of control? And if one of those decisions is putting potentially harmful um, chemicals into your body that are unknown what their effects may be, a lot of students will respond very well to trying to say, no, I do want to have control over my own body. And so another part over here was the one takeaway. A lot of them had said that they really harpened onto the, the body effects. The acetone with the nail polish reference goes over very well. Uh, more information about what vaping is, learning not to vape, um, understanding that a stethoscope can, can give you information without even having to rely upon what a, a person is saying is also critically important. Um, and then another really important uh, point that I want to bring attention to was one thing that myself and the school health officials and the school teachers also um, had utilized during our presentations, which is saying that we underwent much of the same pressures, maybe in a different way, that you're undergoing today and trying to relate with them on that level, saying that even though we're adults, we were once in your shoes and trying to say that it's a, it's a normal thing to be either put into a situation where you might be offered to be taking different substances, you feel pressured, there's other things such as social status and trying to fit in that might be um, tying in with these decisions and trying to really normalize that feeling that we, we, we sympathize with you, we empathize with you and we wanna help. And so we're actually going to begin a learning activity. Um, and so what's going to happen in a moment where there's gonna be four separate examples um, if everyone wants to potentially be able to access some polling questions that we're going to try to do. 
And um, as part of this, there's gonna be four scenarios where I would like for people to be able to give their ideas for what kind of learning activity might be the most effective strategy for delivering this learning objective. And I'll try my best to be able to um, relate those to everyone on a very clear basis. And then we're also going to be discussing who are the key stakeholders that might be able to deliver this? Just to jump to, towards the end of the point of that is that we are all working together. And so here are the four answer choices, uh, a school-based simulation activity, a blended flipped classroom, which is where students will do pre-work beforehand, some kind of online interactive program or a panel discussion. What might be the most appropriate um, setting for each one of these different learning activities? And so, and here are some of the different examples for who those stakeholders might be. And just for something to each of us to think about, those actually won't be included on the questions. All right, and here we go into our first learning scenario. And so in just a moment, I'm going to launch the poll. And this first scenario is, all of them are from middle-aged students. And the idea is, is to try to um, have a role-playing activity where they're trying to learn how to say no, learn different ways, because it's very difficult for them to actually be able to deliver those words. And so part of the other um, learning opportunity or lear uh, goals for this learning activity is to provide peer feedback on their abilities to simulate a situation and then to be able to act it out as far as how they might be able to say no to this. So I'll give you all a few moments to be able to look through this and try to find some different answers and then we'll talk about what might be one of the more effective ways to deliver this strategy. Great, we're able to get a lot of responses right now. Thank you, everyone. Just a few more seconds. We'll give each one a minute. Three, two, one. Please, if anyone didn't get a chance to answer, there are more opportunities with these next questions. And so everyone here, most the majority of people, 30, 50% were able to highlight what were the, uh, the seemingly correct answer, which is a school-based simulation activity. And so if students are able to role play and to put themselves into an actual situation, such as being at a friend's house when their parents are not there, when one of the students has an older sibling who has a vape pen or a vaping device and they offer them, hey, let's vape. Our parents aren't gonna be found at home. We're not gonna be able to be caught. How do you actually say no to that? Some of the ways that we actually might say to them is say, you know what, it makes me sick and I don't wanna throw up. Or another way might be, um, I actually don't wanna actually catch your germs. We're in the middle of a respiratory crisis right now. So I'm not gonna to try to share anything that might be like a straw. Um, and trying to give actually the students, and we came up with a long list of different ways for people to actually say no, which is hopefully very empowering for when those situations do come up, since many of those middle schoolers were in the same classroom and having the same learning experience, they might be able to relate to it later on. All right, so we're gonna to go to our second scenario. And so this second scenario is the students will be accessing a remote learning platform by any smart device, whether it be a laptop, a, um, a tablet, their phone. <laughs> Many of the students, including middle schoolers, age 11 and 12, will actually have um, either an iPhone, Android, whatever it may be for a smart device. Um, and so the, they're accessing these health resources where they're learning about the overview of health effects or other things such as the social environment for what vaping might be. And then also, not only are they learning about the knowledge of the vaping, uh, they are also interacting with that in some kind of critical way by answering certain questions, whether it be labeling different parts of the body, such as if we're saying, where, do, where does the vaping materials go to after it goes through your mouth? If they say and identify that it's their lungs, they might be able to understand how those health effects for the lungs might look a little bit easier. And so, I'm gonna end this poll at one minute again and share the results. So as you can see, 83% uh, were able to identify what is theoretically the most effective way to be able to deliver this, which is an online interactive program. And so to be able to discuss what might some the people that could help to deliver this content, 
maybe an industry expert that has some understanding for generating an online learning platform such as an app, a website, other things that might have the ability to deliver this information to the students directly. Um, and then they're learning amongst themselves with peers. So as far as it's resource intensive in the beginning, but then you can deliver it widely to inaccessible areas. So, and this is assuming hopefully that many people will have access to some kind of smart device. Okay, and so we're gonna move to our third question. And so for this one, students will be provided resources on marketing strategies in a pre-work type of an environment. And so they are going to be given information about if, if different vaping companies are trying to potentially target such as person's social status, trying to fit in, understanding where people might be coming from for exposing it to a, on a social media platform and giving a, a pertinent examples for those, there's gonna be information delivered before class and then during class they'll be given an example where they're assigned to a small group and they're going to have to outline the different ways that a certain um, advertisement or marketing strategy was delivered what was the reason why what are they trying to appeal to whether it was from the past more of a sex appeal and it's now a humor appeal and trying to fit in and trying to have social status and being cool or if it's stress relieving having to understand these different ideas is critical to be able to uh, label and identify them and then they're also able to share their peer learning. And so this is a great example for trying to learn uh, together, uh, which is one of those uh, critical um, pedagogy, which is the, the child learning strategies. And so interestingly enough, this is one of the more difficult um, uh, actual learning techniques to identify, but this is considered a blended flipped classroom. And so students are doing pre-work and learning beforehand with the expectation that they're going to be applying the pre-work inside the classroom. And then actually they're going to be teaching others. So when they share their results from the small learning activity, they're all engaging at a very high and very active level. And so this is a really high engagement strategy to be able to develop a health promotional um, uh, activity that involves to really being engaged and so it's not reliance upon whoever's the teacher whoever's the prof health professional to, to be delivering the content it relies upon generating resources and platforms to make something that is appropriate for the target audience and then also able for the students to take that information and apply it in the actual classroom and so it is potentially a small class um, learning activity but the learning technique is a blended flipped classroom And here, here's our last one. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for bearing with us. This is going to be the last one before we go into a, a summary. And so this is for, uh, the, the, for a diverse young expert grouping to be able to discuss what their experiences were. And just as I was being able to discuss prior, um, we all can somewhat maybe relate to what it was like being a teen uh, or an adolescent dealing with stress peer pressure, social status, other things of that nature, and trying to fit in, and that desire to fit in, and I think we can all relate to that and empathize with it to a very high degree. And it's critical for um, adolescents who are in this absolute essential stage for development to have those strong role models. And whether those role models are giving kind of this um, pie in the sky idea of I'm perfect, I had no flaws when I was growing up, is not necessarily a very healthy thing for them to be able to see. And to be able to understand that we all were going through similar things when we were teens and adolescents. It's a really important thing for them to be able to see positive role models. And so this might be a really good example to have a panel discussion with some kind of experts in the field where you have near peer learning. And so they have an opportunity to really engage with people that were, under, were going through similar situations and what they have learned through those experiences, which is a critical way. And so those, these are all great opportunities to be able to um, to try to really go at these different um, factors that are leading to these adolescents having these vaping conditions and trying to get to the root cause for how we can create for, um, holistic health for them. And one public health principle I wanted to use for this is actually highlighting it from the health belief model, where there's all types of individual factors that lead to someone making a healthy decision, which might be to stop vaping or to not even consider vaping in the beginning. And there's all sorts of different cues to action for that. 
which might be the exposures from social media platforms, from peers, wherever they might be experiencing this. It might be in the storefront, uh, seeing a vaping device that's readily available or to an older sibling, unfortunately. Um, but it's critical for us to be able to identify those different high yield areas and try to come up with ways to be able to empower the youth to be able to say no to those. And so if we're trying to understand what their perceived understanding for the severity is, we might be able to be more readily um, equipped to um, kind of deliver more information and knowledge to these um, to the youth to be able to impact what they might do for their actual behavior. Because at the end of the day, it's a personal choice that we won't be able to, to hold their hand throughout 24 seven for the rest of their life. And they will have to make that decision. And so we're trying our best to do all what we can to empower that. And so these are just the learning objectives that we were able to go through today. Hopefully people were able to, um, to relate to these topics on a couple of different levels. Um, and here's some resources that will be in the public posting that we will make it available at some place for this. And I believe just um, some other acknowledgements. P please feel free to email me with any questions about this. I'm happy to try to help out with anyone that might be looking to create more targeted per, um, materials or resources or programming, hopefully, um, to be able to address this current crisis, which hasn't you know, unfortunately, it's, or, it's there, but we don't necessarily have all the understanding of what the implications may be. And so hopefully we can get out ahead of this before it becomes too much worse. And so with that, I will stop my sharing. In just a moment when I get there, and here we go. Excellent. Thank you so much for that great presentation. So now we have just about five minutes left to go into some questions that we have here. Um, and just to review, we had a few questions. This is being recorded and will be made available on the Mass Department of Public Health website. And we'll also be emailing the slides out after um, the presentation with the evaluation. Um, so we had a, quite a few questions here. Dr. Wagner, you started answering some that pertain to you. And there were two that were very similar regarding um, items in the waiting room in the era of COVID-19. So um, you recommended soothe, uh, soothing stones, waiting room reading materials. Um, how do we use those or do we use those during this time? Yeah, that was a great question. Um, I was just starting to answer it on the Q&A here. Uh, so both with, you know, lowering a mask for a deaf patient who may need to visually see the mouth for communication or for items in the waiting room, I think this is a case of protecting the, you know, patients in the community um, at this point is a higher priority than either doing what you can for anxiety reduction or even making the office accessible. Uh, so I would let patients know in advance that there won't be any reading materials or toys in the office, um, but encourage them to, you know, have what they want to listen to ready on their device and bring earbuds. Um, my office has disposable earbuds, so you can always give those to the patient, you know, they're sealed. Um, I don't think it's um, I think it's very fair to not, you know, lower one's mask and to make sure we adhere to all PPE um, protocols. Um, for things like hot stones, those would be wiped down in the manner of every other uh, solid surface in the um, operatory. I wouldn't consider it necessary, so maybe that's something that an office elects to just reduce all risk by not having available. Um, but you could tell patients to bring something they can hold on to. You know, some people even bring a a scrap of fabric or something, um, or just let them know in advance there may not be as many um, of these um, creature comforts as there might normally be. But I think that it's very fair for an office to reduce the, you know, as many objects as is not really necessary. Um, just let patients know beforehand so they can both prep themselves uh, mentally and also bring their own objects that you feel comfortable with. Excellent, thank you. And for you, Alec, um, how can an adult, particularly someone screening for oral health, tell if a minor has started vaping? And how can dental health educators provide an opportunity for education if they do know that somebody is vaping? Yeah, this is a great question. I think what a lot of people have on their minds. And um, we don't have quite as hard evidence for this point exactly just yet, but I will be kind of forthcoming from my preliminary discussion with a lot of my I would say 
18 year old patients that have been chronically vaping, and we do have that discussion, that it might be a little bit more evident that they have a higher degree of xerostomia than a, an 18 year old might have at that point without having other risk factors involved. Um, and the key hallmark for uh, what I've been able to identify has also been um, that it's very similar to what you might have, um, you, some people might see with chewing tobacco where you would see a localized abrasion from different um, materials. So if they're only vaping specifically in one side, there might be a little bit of recession, there might be localized inflammation and bleeding on probing in an area, specifically on the corners of the, of the lips that they might be having more of. Uh, and so the xerostomia, I usually open with that type of question and try to learn more from there. And just as Dr. Wenger had been discussing, trying to be as non-judgmental as possible and saying that this is definitely something that we want to not necessarily um, punish and be judgmental about, but to have it as a learning opportunity. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and we had a question about using videos in the waiting room or exam rooms about vaping and you had responded, um, we're trying to find platforms that have these resources publicly available. Um, so this seems like that's something that's in the works, which is great. Um, and then Rosie, you had a question that you started to answer as well. How are referrals between the dental and medical home completed? Is it bidirectional, especially for those patients who have chronic conditions and oral health can be a health risk? Yeah, I, um, at this point, dental offices, especially private offices, don't really have access to any um, central encrypted databases for health information. Uh, so if I am concerned about um, something going on with the patient's health, I'll usually just call their primary care physician's office and use either fax or encrypted email uh, to send them a message and then put a note in our calendar to follow up if we haven't heard. So I would say it's a similar process as communicating with other dental specialists. Um, you know, especially nowadays, you may not want to um, write anything on paper or, or hand it off, but I think it's very fair to call or email um, a health provider. Excellent. Thank you. And just one last question that I think is really important for Dr. Wagner. Do you recommend asking children which pronouns the child prefers or do you eliminate all gender questions on the intake forms? Uh, well, I don't ask about gender um, in any forms. As for pronouns, the, um, that question is on our pediatric medical history intake form, as well as adults. Um, and so, yes, we do ask patients what pronouns to use for uh, their kids as well. And I think that's important. Um, I do get asked a lot, well, what if someone doesn't know what you mean by that? Um, and you can just answer, oh, as an example, he, him, she, her, they, them. And uh, interestingly, I, we've asked over a thousand patients um, for pronouns or their children's pronouns since we started doing this. And thus far, we haven't had anyone who felt upset that we asked. Um, just a few dozen people out of that thousand have asked for clarification for what we mean. And a large number, um, you know, over 200 have been very pleased that we asked the question. So I encourage folks who might feel a little um, apprehensive or unsure about including that question, even for pediatric um, intake forms that um, folks are pretty used to it or appreciate it or just ask for clarification. And especially if it's in a list of demographic information, like put it, you know, between the address and phone number um, to show that this is just routine, um, then they're very, very accepting of it. Excellent. Thank you. And that's all the time we have for today. So I just want to thank uh, both of our presenters as well as the attendees for being a part of this great session. Um, and next week we'll be holding the third session of the Oral Health Equity Virtual Summit. So please join us then for presentations on community health workers working in oral health and dental care for the LGBTQ plus community. And finally, you'll be receiving an email after the presentation concludes with a link to an evaluation as well as the slide. So thank you everybody so much for attending. Have a great day.